Hello, hello. I was looking online the other day and I found an interview that I did with Neil 10 years ago on the 30th anniversary and we did a track by track on moving pictures on the 30th. And it was really interesting to, because what he said was, this was one of the records for you where you weren't getting as much pressure to be something that somebody else wanted you to be. Like by this point, Rush was Rush now. And, yeah. and there was a freedom in this kind and this record that maybe you didn't have in the first handful. And that this was a record where you got to just be yourselves. Did you guys feel that way as well? Yeah. Yeah, but I kind of felt like we always were ourselves, but it didn't always yeah. work out. <laughs> yeah. In our minds, we you know, were. <laughs> we made a lot of mistakes uh, because we were so determined to be ourselves. And, and uh, from the minute Neil came into the band in 74, uh, something shifted because his presence was a confirmation of... Uh, he had a willingness to experiment in the same way that Alex and I had already been, uh, you know, going down that road in a way. So it was like a confirmation. It was like the circle had been closed. And, and so we kept experimenting. And sometimes we got a little sidetracked, like with Caress of Steel. It was a pretty weird record in hindsight. But, um, See, but I, I love that record because when I was young and I heard that, it was a metal record. And I heard Chris Steele and went, this, that's what got me into the band, mm. was hearing that. Oh, really? So in a way, and then yeah. of course 2112 became this iconic thing in our life, but yeah. Chris Steele just sounded like, I don't think people can play like this, <laughs> right? The way you guys have done. So it's amazing yeah. what felt like a, maybe a mistake or a sidetrack brought a whole bunch of other people into your fold. Yeah, I mean, that was an interesting time for us, but yeah. uh, we kept making our own mistakes and, and uh, learning from them. And, and by the time we hit this record, uh, we had a lot of confidence. But the confidence that comes from making mistakes is different than the confidence that comes from winning all the time. It's a different kind of confidence, right? So I, I'm not sure you could have made this record the way you did if you hadn't had those experiences beforehand. You're absolutely right. It's a completely different kind of confidence. You, this is more stepped. You work your way up. You learn what's the right thing to do. And, and when we got to this record, it was really that thing. There was a particular energy that was so positive. It was such a fun record to make. We had so much fun in the studio playing, being, in those, being up in the studio uh, for, I guess, the second time by mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. was a treat for us. So we were all in such a good headspace. You know, when we did Witch Hunt, we were down on the driveway by the studio, yeah. out in the cold, being the, you know, the, the, the mob, yeah. uh, and doing that. I just have such great memories <laughs> of that, just we were laughing our heads off, and, you know, we were trying to be an angry mob, yeah. but if you listen closely, you can hear some of the things we were saying, and uh, it's just, it was just a vibe about the whole thing that was so very positive. Yeah. We set up microphones on the driveway, yeah. and all of us in our crew were grumbling into the mic and screaming absurd things. That was how we created this mob, from, from overdubbing it over and yeah. over and over right. again. You know, from you know eight people, we turned it into an angry mob <laughs> of footballers. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that came up in that interview with Neil, the thirtieth, was how the witch hunt lyrics were relevant then, and when you. When you listen to this record today, yeah. and it got me thinking, it's like, I, does anything really change? Wow. <laughs> and I don't know how much yeah. it does. It's yeah. so true. And a lot of things that Neil wrote about over the years yep. are as valid today as they were then. Right. And yet they were considered you know, inappropriate for a metal band to be talking about such things. But uh, is it ever inappropriate? You know? I don't think so. No, I don't, you know, I never grew up listening to kids' music, and I don't really think that kids should. You know, I know the value of it when you're an infant, but I, I kind of feel yeah. like you have to, I feel like you have to kind of have the trees rattled early. Yeah. At least in your mind. Sparks. Yeah. Who was that for you? I had to, you know, because to be independent, to, 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 because you could have gone a million different ways from the late 60s into the early 70s. Rush could have, you could have played 20 different genres. You're all different, talented enough, you could have done whatever you wanted. What were the things that you were being exposed to that led you to figure out that this is the way you want it to be? That's really a tough question to answer because our influences were so diverse and so uh, 
There were so many different bands we loved. Of course, all the early British blues bands really got us started. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we played very much in the, in the style of all those early bands like John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, Jeff Beck and people like that. Cream. Yeah. Cream, for sure. And then as time went on and, and progressive rock became a huge influence to all of us, probably less so to Alex than it was to me, but uh, uh, and Neil was very influenced by progressive rock. Uh, and then you just start listening to all kinds of things. You know, I was a big Joni Mitchell fan. I liked Paul Simon's songwriting, you know. Uh, Al had his own things that he was into. And you brought all these things to the table in Rush. And, and it was fine, you know, that nothing was verboten as long as we felt we could do it and we could do it authentically. Mm -hmm. It was fine. And so that's how our style morphed, I guess. Yeah. What were your influences then after... I was probably more in sort of a rock vein, but certainly that progressive music uh, was an influence. Like were you Zeppelin Sabbath kind of rock? or um, Zeppelin, for sure. Humble Pie, yeah. uh, Jeff Beck. Um, but, you know, I, I loved Yes, uh, King Crimson. You know, there was just so much music. But like Ged just said... Listening to other things like Joni Mitchell, listening to the, the crafting of songs and what works and what doesn't work and what really stands out in a song and the pacing and all of those things about the structure of a song, you learn about that through listening. You don't maybe are, are not directly influenced by the music itself, but how it's constructed and, and how it works uh, becomes the important thing, I think, and you carry that on forever. Yeah, I'm not sure how many people know that you were, you had all these fake bands, right? Like, was it the Fabulous Men? Was that was that a band? That you were there? <laughs> yeah, there was the Fabulous right? Men. There was a couple of them. Like these, are side, these were side bands. Yeah, side yeah. bands. And that you would like create these fake <laughs> bands in your mind and just let's try to do it like this. Is that how you? Yeah, well, the Fabulous Men were a very new wave. Yes, yes. they were fabulous, <laughs> and they were men. And, yes. they were, <laughs> and, and I do have the tapes of the Fabulous Men. Yeah, and there are some some tapes that shall remain. Tapes. You yeah, need to away. hear those. <laughs> yeah. it, but were, were, were records on, songs on here from those kinds of sessions where you took on other... Oh. Well, Vital Signs is a direct yeah. influence by the Fabulous Men. Really? Yeah. Yeah. There's, That's no, true. <laughs> there's That's no very true. doubt about it. it. was inspired by our Fabulous Men persona. But uh, <laughs> Was it just a chance for you to have some fun or was it, was it actually a mechanism to push yourself? Uh, no, it was fun. Fun. And if it, yeah. if it pushed us and influenced us, that was accidental. Yeah. yeah. But fun is contagious. And you want to bring, you know, especially for a band that writes about, quote, heavy topics, mm -hmm. if you can ingest a bit of fun in it, that's all the better. Uh, so, uh, yeah, those were fun side things that we did usually while we were waiting to do our next take, you mm -hmm. know, because, yeah. you know. Uh, as the production staff was fucking around in there, getting sounds or being on the phone or, <laughs> or something on the like phone that, for a long time. you're sitting in there going, "Can we do this take already?" And then you just break out into some jam thing. That that's how really how the Fabulous Men got. You just call out, "We're the Fabulous Men now," and away we yeah. go. Yeah, we were just like there you was. Know. There was one particular phone call that Terry Brown made to his mother mm -hmm. in England, and he was on the phone for half an hour. And we were sitting, we were like, we stopped the take so that he could take the call. <laughs> and we were just sitting there and sitting and sitting and sitting. And finally we started playing and we, we actually went through many different genres. That's right. In that particular mm -hmm. song. Yeah. The title of that song escapes me. Yeah, we right <laughs> remember, but you just won't tell us. But, <laughs> but no, it the, is a classic. The point is, uh, the point is you, uh, you let yourself go because you can't just sit and wait. You're right. pent up, you're yeah. ready to record, and you just start jamming, and you start, and you take, you vent your frustration yeah. through the microphone. <laughs> how, much of, how much of the guys that you became in those days was directly related to the, your parents' stories? You know, if you think about metal and rock and growing up in Toronto in that era, it was a very different kind of place than most places in the world. You know, a lot of new immigration here. You were from that. How much was that influencing who you were as songwriters and as performers and as the kind of men you wanted to become? Mm, that's a good question because, you know, 
those influences are kind of subterranean, you know, they're subconscious. We were playing that kind of music to escape from all that shit, to escape from the home life, yeah. to escape from, uh, you know, in my case, uh, a, a family that was, you know, reassembled post-war and had its fair share of function and dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, when early we... Early trauma conversations, right? Like people are talking about trauma, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but that was in your home because your parents were had experienced some pretty heavy trauma. Yeah, and, and you know, Al's, you know, tough working class family. So I, I think when we got together, it was to escape all that. Mm -hmm. And music was the salvation, you know. We all uh, dove into music because of that. We wanted to escape into that world. Yeah. But we were willing to work hard, and I think... It was that work ethic that we learned from our parents. That was like get yeah, said. Like, that's true. Uh, subconscious work ethic. But it didn't feel like it. Work. Didn't feel like it. Work. It <laughs> felt great, but you were willing to work twenty four hours a day on something yeah. if if you needed to, just to make it as good as you you could. And you wouldn't think about it. It was a joy. Uh, and, and it was it was those words to make it. You know, you you use those words. You thought about that idea. We're going to make it. We didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Of course yeah. not. But if we worked hard enough and we got good enough, we might make it. Yeah. And that was our, our, you know, it was our version of running away to join the circus, really. Right. And then suddenly the circus worked like you made it. However, it became. When did you first figure? It took out? a long time. <laughs> it did take a long time, but not that long. I guess not. You know, relatively speaking. Yeah. You know, I, we know about the Kiss stories now because they're legendary. But my friend Bob sent me a picture of tables. It made me laugh. It was a, um, it was a concert ticket of it was Rush and the New York Dolls, <laughs> and it was amazing to see our, this this bill. And I'm looking at this, yeah, yeah, thinking you played with everybody. <laughs> you played on bills that probably yeah. people think that wouldn't make sense. But New York well, we, well, we played on bills that didn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> We opened for Shana Na. Yeah, yeah, you that know, was a great. Gig. That makes no sense. Yeah, <laughs> at a Sadie, Sadie Hawkins dance. Yeah, in Baltimore, and we got booed off the stage. Oh, screaming at us, so we just turned yeah. up. Of course, more and, more and, and more. we should have got booed off the stage because <laughs> they were all dressed like the Fonz, you know. Yeah. yeah. And here comes this like really loud metal band, and they're like, "What, what the hell what are the you fuck doing? Is this, you know?" So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we played. We got. We took every gig that was offered to us, pretty yeah. much. The era of building your brand, like everybody talks about it now, wasn't really part of your lexicon back then, was it? No, it wasn't. It didn't exist, no, really. Didn't. You know, first of all, we were not a band that, that uh, got airplay easily. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, I guess, in context of the times, it was a crude sound. Mm -hmm. And we sounded a little bit too much like Zepp and a little bit too much like Humble Pie. So, you know, we were falling through the cracks. So... The best way we could make friends and fans was to be on the road and to get out in front of people. So we opened for everybody we could and we mm -hmm. traveled constantly. And slowly and slowly we built a groundswell. But it was very gradual. I mean, it yeah. was really r around the time of this album that it all finally came together. Now, there were some tough, lean times, certainly, yeah. Yeah. that period with Chris Steel and uh, but it was a very gradual thing, and that that was six years right there. Plus, we've been playing together for six years before that. Right. So, no overnight success. It it took its time. I think it's deceptive when you sit here in 2022 yeah. and you look back at a 50 year career, and you go, "Oh, well, that didn't seem to take so long from the first record to yeah. 21." Well, that was just couple of years but when you're in that moment it sure felt a lot longer yeah, right. and you are experiencing all those difficulties on a daily basis like when are we can we afford to be on the road there was times and we'd get stranded without gigs and we'd be staying in a hotel in LA and we didn't know when the next gig was and we couldn't really afford to pay the hotel bill so you just had to beg, borrow, steal money from the record company, tour support, whatnot. And that time lasted a lot longer than people realized, yeah. you know, that you were, you know, hand to mouth, tour to tour. And then suddenly things start to change. Fame is a lot easier to get than financial success. Right. So you give the appearance that you're successful, but you're still trying to make ends meet and you're pouring every 
bit of profit you have back into the show to make it better. Uh, so you don't think about uh, the show in practical terms. You think of it in terms of how can we make it better? So, And I think people who have never been broke don't really understand that when no. you're broke, it's a year feels like 10 years, right? It feels like an insurmountable mountain or hill. It feels like it's it might never end. And yeah. it's really, and we see this today in the world. It was one thing that I think that maybe why Rush lasts so long is that lyrically and culturally when people, people kind of feel seen, even though some of it may seem fantasy-based, they feel seen that this is, you're not a good times band. <laughs> right, and, and it's not a good time set of lyrics. Like this is, it's heavy times, and maybe partly because you experience those heavy times. Mm. You never forget. Yeah, you'll never yeah. really not be that person, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. It's, I, I know you don't like to do this, to talk about any of this stuff without Neil, but here we are, and you have 40 years, and this has got to be really difficult and strange yeah. and experience. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, you know, life post Neil is still fresh yeah. in a way. And uh, um, what can I say? I think he would be proud of this. And certainly be proud of the live aspect of this record mm -hmm. uh, because his playing is really good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's all he cared about. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, well, I shouldn't say that's all he cared about, but that was yeah. first and foremost in his mind. So um, He had said to me once that a big part of what you guys did was write stuff that would be a challenge to play live. Like, and there was always a song on the record that you would write knowing you couldn't play it live. Yeah. Pre-technology, mm -hmm. and that was important to you. But that whole concept of having to play it live drove our arrangements, yeah. it drove our songwriting. And so we'd be in the middle of writing a song, well, we could do this, but if we do that, it's gonna be impossible to play it live, so let's not do that. Yeah. And so in some ways, you limited the scope of the song in order for you to be true to your live architecture. You know, the three-piece thing that could be convincingly uh, reproduced live. And, and that, for the longest time, was our mantra, really. Yeah. It was only later years where we started going, fuck it. That's... What does a song need? <laughs> it needs 15 you know, tracks of guitar. What does a song need? Does it really need that 15th track of guitar? <laughs> yeah. No, but it's cool. <laughs> but the strings are good. Yeah. How are we going to reproduce the strings? We'll figure it out. Well, then MIDI brought a lot, a lot of changes, yeah. I suppose. MIDI yeah. changed it, everything. It changed Synthes everything. saved, um, changed everything. Samplers saved, every, you know, changed everything. But those earlier uh, so the arrangements, when we went on the road, it sounded exactly the same as the, the record, which was really important. I this think. Maple Leaf Garden show is interesting because it's, you know, it's pre-tech in many respects, mm -hmm. and it's these three guys crushing it on stage, and it does sound like the record in a lot, yeah. of, but it still feels live, right? And that's why I think it's an interesting choice to have this particular show. Yeah, you know, uh, as the as the one that people and people are very excited about that particular show. They are. Yeah. I, I, I've read a couple of reviews, and uh, fans are really pleased to have it because it's one night. Yeah, you know, it's not a compilation, and it's just an actual reliving that night. And I thought the choice of Terry to mix it was yeah, really sure. great, and it was nice to be in contact with him again. I mean, it was really, it was a little nostalgic, but at the same time. It's great getting emails, finding his name in my inbox, right. and, and, and having to talk about the songs again. And of course, some, many of them were right in his wheelhouse. That was his period of time. That right. We were very tight you know, uh, during that uh, Moving Pictures album. And he was our mentor in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was appropriate to revisit this live tape with, uh, with Terry at the helm. When you hear back and you hear the three of you on stage, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. Could have done that better. <laughs> Why did I play yeah, that? You note? just hear the shitty stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You do. You really do. And, Boy, and it really never ends. Fuck that. <laughs> There's a clam. A clam. Yeah. <laughs> clam. I mean, you guys could have written easier songs to play. So yeah. <laughs> you know. That's the other thought you have. And then the other hand, you go, wow. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. yeah. You know. So you're always reluctant to, to praise yourself looking back. Yeah. I saw the last show in L.A., um, and I knew you guys wanted to keep being in Rush, and of course Neil didn't want to or couldn't, and then and then we lost him. And you're living in this very bizarre experience now because you two can still do it. Yeah. And I just wonder how you process that, how you figure your way through that. 
Well, we, I'd say Al and I have different ways of dealing with that. And yeah. Al threw himself into little projects and bigger projects, and he kept working throughout the whole thing, and that was a real tonic for him. Yeah. And I can relate to that because when, uh, when we went through our first set of tragedies with Neil back when he lost his wife and daughter, mm -hmm. uh, I did that. I threw myself into my solo album and, it, you know, it, it, it saved me in, in many ways. And it, it, uh, it fed me, let's put it like that. And so for myself, I turned to writing and I turned to book writing. And that was a way for me to not compete with that moment and those feelings, but a way to take stock and and recharge my batteries in a different way. So we've handled it quite differently. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's it was a difficult thing to put aside. I mean, I don't think there are many bands that uh, had a 45-year career that were as close as we were. I know right after the tour, both get it, I felt like we still had a lot of gas in the tank. Yeah. The show looked great. We were playing really, really well. We just, if we could just squeeze out another 150 shows, yeah. you know. <laughs> but Yeah, we were, I was hoping that, you know, let's be honest, it was frustrating to end when we ended. Yeah. I was frustrated because was awesome. I worked so hard on that tour yeah. in terms of design and putting it all together and the whole concept of, of going backwards, you know, a, a chronology that uh, exposes itself or, or exploits itself while going back in time. Back. And so I was really proud of it. I wanted to take it to Europe to play for the European fans. I wanted to take it to South America, and, and that wasn't going to happen. So it was truncated in my view, yeah. in my mind. And I had to swallow that because I had to think of my friend's needs and, yeah. and what he wanted. But yeah. it, it was frustrating. And, and so we, you know, we walked away from that and we went to do our other things. I went traveling. Alex was golfing. And, mm -hmm. and, and then Neil got sick. Yeah. And so what do you do with all those feelings? Yeah. Right. You just throw them away because yeah, they don't mean anything anymore. Did you at some like, before you found out? I, I imagine maybe deep in some part of your heart, you thought maybe we can play a show again. Oh yeah, I yeah, thought you know, that you know maybe he has, he has three months at home. He'll get sick of them yeah. and don't want to come back on the road and play with <laughs> yeah. the boys. Yeah. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Uh, of course, I had a feeling that wouldn't be the case, and I think Al did as well. Yeah. But you never know. Regardless, uh, we just went on with our lives, right. and then. And then he got sick and everything changed. Grief is hard, but grieving, knowing that you're grieving in a public context too. That's what's really, really bizarre about what you have to experience. Yeah, because it is a very private kind of thing. Yeah. And, and that's why he knew. didn't want anyone to know. Yeah. You know, he just didn't. He wanted to keep it in the house. Yeah. And we did. And that was hard. And you're an emotional guy. You're emotional, right? Too. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. So, Excuse me, he's Serbian. Yeah, that's right. You're both very <laughs> emotional people, and the, the, the mustn't grumble doesn't always work with emotional people. Right. Yeah. How hard that is. <laughs> so here you are, grown-ass men with lots, lots of success, and you have, to learn a new, you have to learn a new way to do something again, like how to handle it. Yeah, that was hard. Yeah. I, I, I can't tell you it was easy because it was not easy, and it was ongoing. Yeah. And, you know, his diagnosis was... Uh, you know, he was given, you know, 18 months at the most. And it went on three and a half years. Right. And so that was a constant flow of us, you know, going to see him, giving him support. Uh, and what his family had to live through was really difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a lot of back and forth. And when you're in that state, it's very hard to function normally because you can't talk to anyone about it. Right. Because no one's supposed to know. And so people hear rumblings and they bring things up to you and you, you deflect it. And so that feels, on the one hand, it feels dishonest. Yeah. But on the other hand, you're being loyal to your friend. So fuck the dishonesty part. Right. You know, that, that wins. And so uh, it's, I would say that was the most difficult time for us to move forward during that whole thing. Because... We were in this bubble of, of, of grief, sort of walking towards an inevitable and terrible conclusion. Right. 
and then and then you still have to live you still have to feel you still have to be vital after all this that process takes its time too mm -hmm. yeah and i imagine you're still in that yes yeah yes so you have your projects you know are you playing i play yeah but i've forgotten how to turn on my tape recorder do you so. play without that? <laughs> there's got to be tapes. There's got to be. There's got to be licks somewhere. No, I go down and play, yeah. and I know that there'll be a moment. I've been working on this uh, memoir, which I don't know if you speak Jewish, but I now refer to as my Fakakta memoir. <laughs> <laughs> it's a project I thought was a great idea at the right. time, and now I'm finding that it's just soaking up my entire being. So right. I'm looking forward to delivering the first draft of that and and then I will have a free space in my mind and and you know in a way it was a kind of therapy for me to work through all of these things mm -hmm. and I think I will be then in a in a good state of mind to move forward mm -hmm. I can't wait to talk about the book when the book happens but this yeah, idea yeah. of therapy is yeah. you know, different forms of therapy is really interesting yeah for me that the year after Neil's death was the most difficult that was that's the real grieving period yeah. i didn't really play much didn't listen to music just couldn't stop thinking about it but it was almost after the anniversary it was like walking through a door it's like okay now i'm just going to think about the good stuff and look forward to doing something else and then got involved in the envy of not project and and that felt really good because I was playing on a regular basis, doing something that I've always done. I felt like that was a really great therapy for me. We all find it. Yeah, no, I mean, but you were you were always that dude. Like, yeah, you always had a guitar in your dressing room. You had a guitar in your hotel room, yeah. and uh, you smoke a joint, and I could hear you three doors down yeah. in a hotel playing on your balcony. <laughs> uh, so t yeah. you're connected to that guitar. You have yeah. to play. Yeah. That's who you are, you know. It's different I have that. other interests, and I got sidetracked into this uh, history of my instrument. So I was still writing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, about music. I, when I did the big book of bass, I was obsessed with my instrument. I was playing every day, and I was investigating every instrument known to man that's ever been written, ever been built with four strings. Yeah. Uh, so it was a different kind of re-education, and to me, I was paying homage to the instrument that brought me everything, you know. And so that felt like a worthwhile endeavor, mm -hmm. uh, like a good use of my time. Uh, and that took me two years through a very difficult part of that whole process. Uh, but what a great result. That book is just amazing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. It's spoken it's, like my friend. Yeah, it's stunning. <laughs> it's stunning, and it and, and 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 what it doesn't ever feel like when I went through it was, oh, Getty plays bass, so someone else assembled this, and we're putting Getty's name, and he approved it. Yeah, it didn't feel like an approved <laughs> book. It felt yeah. like work, <laughs> like yeah, like the, you came by it in, in an authentic, honest way. Yeah, yeah no, it yeah. was work, but it was uh, really educational and. Uh, I, I just can't tell you how much I learned about my own instrument. It was, it was a great project to do, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah. What you said about you didn't really think about music is really, really interesting, because I've heard a few cats talk about this when they lose somebody or, or when they go through this. Suddenly this thing that's a huge part of their life, they're not even thinking about it anymore, and now there's a whole open space in their brain. And trying to figure out how I don't have the tools to do this without the guitar in my hand, yeah. and what that has been like for you. Yeah, it was the same thing when uh, Neil lost his wife and daughter. Yeah. Uh, really t was not interested in, in music at all for a year. And then after that period, it's just a reawakening. You've gone through your, your grief. Now it's time to get back into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to work for me. Like I, I suppose people pro can process a little quicker or a little later. But that's what it is for me. This seems like a year is that grieving period and then it's time to move on and it was a relief actually to move out of that with this one because i really missed it right mm -hmm. yeah. you know it, it's to think you can trick your heart yeah is a foolish endeavor and get the truth right <laughs> you can't it has to take its own course yeah you can rationalize it all you want yeah, yeah. if you're honest and yeah. honest with yourself you have to let it happen when it's going to happen uh, and it's a process everyone goes through in a different way. 
Oh, it's lost, not easy. You lost your mom too, so like it's not been. Yeah. I guess fire hose on you at this in a way. <laughs> you know, this grief and experience. Well, it's certainly put me in a reflective state of mind. Let's put it like that. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to be less re yeah. reflective in the future. <laughs> I can't wait to become empty and shallow once again. <laughs> Stay in rock and roll long enough and it just might happen. That might happen. It's good yeah. to have goals. Yeah, yeah. Good to have goals. Yeah. So if you, go in the bay, if you go down and you don't turn the record on and you play, have you guys played together at all? Just mess and rest around? No, we haven't. No, we haven't. Really? Yeah. We talk about it we an talk awful about it a lot. lot. Hey, I want you to come over and bring the guitar. Let's play like you. Yeah, that that we're, we're gonna do that. We're gonna yeah. do that. But instead, we get drunk. Yeah, <laughs> or we drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we don't quite make it downstairs. I mean, that's the human two brothers kind of thing that people kind of forget that that it's not as easy as just let's play. Yeah, but you know what? That's a special thing that we know we have. Yeah, and one day we will. Yeah. Monday. I'm sure of it. We do, we spend so much time together anyways, even though... Like you actually do, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 spending time together. We go out for dinner, we do stuff. It's And we have the best time when we go out, just yeah. the two of us. It's awesome. Well, we did that about a month and a half ago. We hadn't had dinner in a while. We just went out to dinner. and we. Right. I remember the feeling. We sat down at the table, <laughs> we looked across the table, and this is where we have been for 45, 50 years yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. And we both did a, a double-handed yeah. high five oh, and, cry. And, and continued the evening and, and got pretty wasted. It was yeah. good. <laughs> but it was great because we'd done it so many times before. <laughs> and just being that far away from each other, looking at each other, it just brought a flood of memories of all the times we did that. Right. And you think... In different places in the world. And you think, he, like, what the fuck... Can you still talk about, right? You think, like, oh, I, we've been having dinner together for yeah. 55 years. What is there left to talk about? We never are yeah. lacking f uh, for something to talk about or yeah. something to joke about. Well, and the world is laying enough to talk about anyway, that yeah. getting each other's perspectives, especially going back on this, like we talked about witch hunt. Like, there's just a lot of shit in the world right now. You're two smart, engaged people. You're going to feel those things and talk about those things. Are yeah. you hopeful people for humanity? And civilization where we are right now? I, I it's used to a be. Tough one. <laughs> it is not a, more. It is a not tough so one. much right now. Uh, I, I had more faith in people yeah. uh, a few years ago than I do right now, but uh, I'm very happy to be wrong about that. Yeah. Just in the last four or five years, it's really done a number on hope. Yeah. What I find really interesting about this time, too, not, it's not as important by any means, but in the last few years is the first time in my life where the music of the youth hasn't been leading any of it. Athletes take bigger stands. Now, when we were younger, yeah, athletes true. didn't, right? They didn't say anything. Now I'm looking at what, and I'm not saying that young people aren't engaged because of course they are. They just, it's just, they're not going to musicians the same way yeah. that they used to. That's a really good point. And, and I think you're right. I think you're onto something there. And I, I, I see the, I don't know what it's like to be young and how you find your bands now and how you you choose your style of music i mean that was it seemed much clearer back when we were were growing up uh the options were more evident um, so uh, it's a confused world and i read the statistic the other day about how 70 percent of young people are listening to the records of our generation and not yeah. listening to new music. And that's a staggering fact. If that's really true, that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's real condemnation of the state of the music business like today. Right, 70%. Yeah. Whoa, or maybe, maybe there's just some truths in what you guys were writing about that you have to have life experience to get to. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's curious. It's curious. I mean, there are certain things like some of the music award shows get canceled and not, no one said anything. No one seemed to care. Yeah. Uh, so Short uh, attention span now. Shorter attention span. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe it's there are too many branches on the tree now. It's, it's everything's so diverse. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Well, film's 100 years old plus, so things naturally change, right? And I'm really curious to see where the place goes. If people are, one thing that hasn't changed, people are actually still reading. Books still, mm. books still get sold. Yeah. Audiobooks are a real thing. Yeah, they are. So that's I like true. the idea that people are reading still. 
and a lot of the, your contemporaries, I know Neil certainly did, the rock and roll is read. Mm. They read books and then they wrote about the shit yeah. they read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what Gene Simmons told me once. He was like freaked out when he was on the road with the Rush in the early days. And he went to your hotel room thinking we'd go get these Canadians to go party. And he opened the door and you were all just sitting there fucking reading. And he, <laughs> yeah. he made that up. Well, he couldn't understand it. He was like, they're just reading. <laughs> Three guys just reading in the room. Yeah, but we were really high. <laughs> That's the difference. That's what's amazing is that you guys were high and drunk, but somehow you didn't become messes. <laughs> yeah. How did that happen? Uh, I don't know. They're t- Luck. proper upbringing, I right. think. Did you ever get close to losing the plot ever? We just didn't know? Mm, there were we had our time we had our moments yeah, where but, we were doing too many gigs too many gigs in a row yeah and the drugs were coming at us fast and furious but somehow or another we kept our shit together through it all but uh, I mean there was one leg there was one leg of one tour that we did 23 one nighters in a row uh, and you know you're you're operating on fumes right. and you're you're doing whatever it takes right. to to get through the to the next show or get through that show. So whether it's smoking a joint afterwards or doing a line of coke or whatever it takes, yeah. you did it. But in the end, uh, we valued our work. We valued our quality of our gigs. So we never let it interfere. Yeah. It couldn't interfere. Otherwise, there was no point to be there. Yeah, yeah. What's the point of being here if you're going to fuck up the gig? Right, because the music was actually important. Yeah. It wasn't Ooh, just a lifestyle. Sure. It was hard to play. So, yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. You know, you were ve- we were very disciplined when it came to shows. There was yeah. not even a beer, like, during the drum solo. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Not even a beer during the... I mean, the drum solo was long. Well, the drum solo was long. Yeah. I mean, there was a time where you might, you know sneak backstage for a bump right at the end of the show. Yeah, <laughs> earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> but you were almost done. Yeah. So, but, and, you know, can you imagine going on and playing La Villa Strangiato after you smoke a couple of joints? Yeah. I don't think oh so. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work too well. I smoked a joint before a rehearsal once. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we jammed for about 20 minutes, like psychedelic surf music <laughs> and it was so great it was like we was having such a great time and then it was like okay let's do the show now we started playing it was like <laughs> i was the only person in the hall with giant <laughs> headphones <laughs> and everything sounded crazy and my hands wouldn't speak to my brain and right ged kept looking over at me like what the hell's going on over there <laughs> <laughs> making mistake after mistake couldn't wait for it to be over but i learned a n- very important lesson don't smoke a joint before a gig yeah not a rush gig anyway <laughs> not no, a rush no. gig, certainly. there's too much okay work. if you're jamming the blues that's fine that's yeah, right or, or psychedelic surf music that's right when um when you go on the when you go and play do you play rush bass lines when i when rehearse? you're just messing around for yourself no i don't play rush oh, bass lines. Yeah. i just play new things just play. Yeah. I just play and I just jam with myself. And sometimes I will put it down on, I was kidding about the yeah. tape machine, but I will put it down and then forget about it. Uh, and I know there'll come a time where I'll start looking through that stuff and I'll go, oh, that's shit, that's shit, that's shit. Oh, that's not shit. And I'll build something off of that. So, And that's the way it's always been, really. Yeah. How do your families manage this version of you guys now? Well, the that's an interesting question. The rhythm's different for them, too. Yeah. Uh, I think, by and large, my family's happy to have me around, as strange as that might sound. <laughs> I was, I've was i been waiting for my wife to get sick of me, but she doesn't seem to. Uh, but if I tell her I'm going away to to hang out with my wino friends for a few days, she doesn't object to that either. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so take that for what it is. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, I like being home now. I like being close. The blessing of the pandemic, the silver lining of the pandemic for me, has been my grandson and having to be there for him. I heard you taught him baseball. That's what I heard. Yeah, we play a lot of baseball and bird watching. We share a love of birds. And now he has left me in the dust. And now he knows every bird. Oh, my God. We We were doing this thing the other day. You don't get me talking about my grandson, otherwise there'll be nothing else right. we'll be talking about. But we were uh, 
there's this Cornell Labs has has these live cams where you go on this website and they have cameras set up all over the world and you can click in and you can see birds from all over the world. And he's watching this one place, I can't remember where it was from right now, but a bird lands, he goes, Sadie, bowerbird, female bowerbird. I go, are you sure, Finney? Yeah. He was right. You know, he just has, he's, he's, talk about a clean slate. He has soaked up all the bird books and he has retained it with that seven-year-old mind of his and it's amazing to see. Really why, why do birds, why do you think birds work for you the way they do? Well, for me, they're the last free uh, uh, aspect or sector of wildlife that's available to all of us at any moment. You don't have to be in a jungle. You don't have to be anywhere other than where you are. You just have to step outside your obsessions and look around. And it's completely edifying for me. And I, I just love it. And my gr grandson loves it now. And my wife puts up with it. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a colorful bird for her. Right. Uh, but uh, no, it's a good escape. And it's brought me closer um, in touch with my own photography. And, and I do enjoy bird photography. It's a real challenge, very difficult. And so that gives me something else to obsess about that has nothing to do with music, nothing to do with book writing, nothing to do with life. Mm -hmm. It's a pure escape. And you, you look at them and you hear that line all the time, those are dinosaurs. Like their connections to our dinosaur past when you see some yeah. birds fly by. Yeah. You know, like that's the real wildlife out there. Yeah, yeah and they're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you eat chicken? Do you eat chicken? I do. And what? birds are beautiful and delicious. Oh my I, God. I definitely oh my agree God. with that. Do you have a bird equivalent? Is it golf? <laughs> Oh, you know, golf, I don't know. <laughs> like, I love golf and I hate it. Are you any good at it? Pieces. I used to be. Yeah. And then, you know, as my brain started shrinking, mm -hmm. I forgot all the things that I knew about <laughs> golf. So now I don't know what I'm playing. I thought your I'm head looked a bit smaller. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the inside for sure. How will your family manage the new you? Like the new reality for you? You know, it's um, my, my kids. We, we had kids very young, so... My my two sons are older than I am, actually. And my grandkids are now in their teens, 18 and 14. So our life is kind of quite independent, and we're just on our own. And we're really, really enjoying that. We're still connected very much to our family and all of that stuff. But uh, our relationship with, with my wife, Charlene, has really, uh, really grown a lot in these last seven years. But like Ed, there's total independence as yeah. well. And I guess we're just so secure. Yeah. So you just follow whatever you want to do and the time together is great. Can't wait to see what comes. What's the next anniversary? God, who knows? Who knows, right? I have to wait for some fan to tell me. <laughs> 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 they know, they know it all. They remind me. When you two finally play together, will you record it? I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah. We'll see. Sure we will. Oh, I like the wink. Did you catch the wink? Because, <laughs> I mean, it's an, I, I, it's an impossible scenario. I, I don't even know how you answer those questions, but it's like people want to see you guys on stages, right? And how do you manage that? Because it's not just as simple as you two playing. There's a lot of emotional reality to that. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's weighing, you know, time. If I've learned anything from the terrible things that have happened in the last few years... It's the value of time mm -hmm. and to make sure you're spending your time the way you want to spend mm -hmm. it. And that's a bigger question than whether Al and I will make a record or Al and I will play together or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's, it's got to be about our time and in our lives because it's precious and it, yeah. man, it goes. And look what, sure look what just happened with Taylor. This is at your last yeah. show. I sat in drummer's row yeah. and Taylor was there and yeah. I watched him watch you. Yeah. And it, that means that. Heartbreaking, just heartbreaking. Yeah, and this I record mean, he, that really broke my heart. Did it? Yeah. His passing, just yeah. so full of life. You know, uh, I remember when he gave us when he presented the award, uh, the Hall of Fame award to us in 2013, and we came up on stage. He was literally yeah. jumping up and down. <laughs> <laughs> like a like a you know two year old he yeah. was jumping up and down he was so happy and 
And that was him. He was so full of admiration and rock and roll joy juice. Mm -hmm. And it just seems wrong that he, he left us. But, you know, so again, time. What did he say to you when he handed you the award? Do you remember what he said? He that? just gave me, me, yeah. just gave me a big hug. Yeah. Oh. He just gave me a big hug. He was, he was amazing. Kid. He was. Yeah, it's a really, it's one of the hardest hitting losses I've, I, I've He just I've, sent me an email like a month ago, uh, just checking in. That's what he would do. He would just check in, right. you know? I can't even imagine what Dave's feeling. Yeah, yeah. horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's, it's yeah. time, how you spend your time. All the more reason, I guess, that's why I think people value so much the two of you together now, yeah. is because the time together is something. Mm-hmm. It's good to see you guys. Congratulations on this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good to spend time with you. Yeah. Uh, no one better for us to talk to than you.